Welcome to the Redline Podcast, featuring co-presenters. Bo, the Banksy of LinkedIn and founder at Javelin Content Management. Shane, CEO at Sales Driven. And Antoine, co-founder at Sales Driven, master of storytelling. Each week we will bring you advice, tips, and thoughts about sales, leadership, and share our experience on growing an effective business. Meet guests, enjoy the stories, and most importantly, have fun. This is Redline Okay, so welcome to this week's episode of Redline Podcast. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. And again, thank you so much for all the amazing um, comments and, and likes and subscribes that we've had over the last few weeks. Absolutely blown away by the reaction that we've had from the podcast. So good to hear it's, it's hitting the notes that everybody wants. Um, for this week's uh, episode four, are we, are we really at episode four already? It's only been like two weeks since we started recording. Amazing. Um, episode four, we have our inaugural guest for the show. Um, so without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Amir to the show. Um, and if you'd be so kind, Amir, if you just kind of run us through um, a 30 second um, overview of, of, of who you are, of anybody who hasn't heard of you, um, where you're at. Yeah, when, you, when I hear you say 30 seconds, I, I mentally thinking I'm 20 seconds is the challenge. Amir Ryder, CEO of CloudTask, I'm, I'm operating. Uh, the world's first and largest B2B sales service marketplace. And we help buyers and sellers of sales services, sales agencies, trainers, consultants, and sales softwares, kind of like an Airbnb, but for B2B e-commerce. I think that was 15 seconds. You've practiced that. <laughs> I've been practicing being on the spot my whole life. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> um, well, look, no, I mean, it's great to have you on the show. Um, I've, uh, obviously known of you and, and met you a good well, a couple of years ago now. And um, I think, you know, part of what the attraction is for this podcast is to really help people that are you know, wanting to start businesses or are starting businesses and they're looking to scale those businesses up. And I think that you're a perfect guest to have on this show because what you've done with Cloud Task, as far as I'm concerned, has been nothing short of an incredible journey. And you know, just kind of want to kind of pick into that a little bit and dive into that if that's okay with you. Um, so, so really my first question is, um, in, in terms of starting cloud tasks, what, what kind of resistance did you meet and how was it that you were able to kind of push through to that kind of first significant win of reaching, a, a, you know, a six figure revenue stream? Seven figure revenue stream. Um, uh, I would say I started off entrepreneurial backwards. So I crushed my first job selling water coolers door to door and they didn't pay me commission. Be sure to pay commission because you'll turn your best sales guy into your weapon. And I immediately decided that it was a good idea to import a container of water coolers from China. Um, I would say that I started backwards, ironically, where I was an entrepreneur first. And then I met my friends who do nothing and were making like 300K a year. And I was like, holy shit, I should have just been an employee. Um, and then I went corporate while running a business at the same time, yes, it's possible if you're a hustler. Um, at 30, I, I decided to get my corporate badge and I remember them being like, oh, this is going to be hard. You're going to have a lot of pressure closing deals on quarters. And I'm like, man, I've been getting sued by employees at like age 25. This is not hard. And I found corporate wipe to be a joke. Um, I was getting paid like 180K to do like nothing. And the more I did, the more trouble I'd get basically. And um then I went back to entrepreneurship after I got fired from NetSuite, which was a job that paid me 180K to basically send templates. Um, there was weekly, there was a weekly actual activity emails that went out and I was crushing everybody because I acted more like an SDR and it made me look bad because they were like, why are you making so many calls and emails and not getting opportunities? Mind you, that's an ERP, which is a half million dollar software. Um, it, you know, the, the, the question of like how to get motivated to be an entrepreneur, it, it really has to do with where you see yourself at, and freedom, right? I think this whole concept that people are like, oh, I'm working for somebody. I want to work for myself is just a joke, right? Like you are working for more people when you own your business. You're working for the government. You're working for your family. You're working for your employees. So if you think that you have a problem working for someone and that entrepreneurial is going to save you, think again, it's going to make it only harder for you. Uh, if you think you want to have a wife and kids and have a business under 40, think again, you're probably going to lose that. So um, I would say... You know, being an entrepreneur has a lot to do with just where you want to get to in life if you want to get to freedom. And it's the harder path, not the easier path. And it's true, right? I'm like the 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 people, the 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 percentage of companies that fail is just the stats are there. It's 90 plus or more of startups, right? So I think you just need to be 
a realist. And I think you need to accept the fact that failure is success, right? And fail fast, right? I think the biggest thing is if I failed faster as an entrepreneur, I would have more cash because I wouldn't have held on. I was good enough to hold on, right? And, and you could hold on for 20 years and wake up and be nothing. So um, don't be afraid to fail. I think we are taught that like, you need to be a billion dollar company to win or you need to be X, Y, Z, but you just actually need to hold your head up high and try and be honest about, we did our best we can and we're going to move on. And, and that's, you know, but it's definitely not the easy path. Oh, so it's, it's a fun answer and there's, there's actually a lot of things to, to kind of delve into there. Um, and, uh, you know, it's very interesting when you talk about corporate life and how, it, you know, actually <laughs> the, the work that you were doing, outperforming other people, outperforming your role, got you into a bit more trouble than... Well, it makes sense because they don't want entrepreneurs, they want robots. No, oh, exactly, exactly. I like that. I guess, what, what, you know, from, from there, I'd like to find out a little bit more about what you think of the, the myth around being an entrepreneur and what kind of problems you think that causes for people today. Like, I'm trying to step into that world. I'm like, dude, it's strange. We live in a strange world. Like I saw Howard Schultz, who's the Starbucks CEO on like, uh, like Capitol Hill being grilled by Bernie Sanders about like being a billionaire. And I'm like, well, what the hell? This guy came from like the projects, worked himself up through the American dream, became a billionaire, provided billions of jobs. And now you're grilling him because you became a billionaire. So like America's this weird place where like you're guilty for not trying and guilty when you win, if that makes sense. So I don't know what's up with that, but yeah, I, it, it's, I think it's interesting because I think this concept of freelancer is here to stay. And I think everybody becomes a business owner by just being a freelancer. Right. So I think that we are now going to be an explosion of business owners that don't really realize they're business owners, right? Agencies of one, media companies of one, right? Um, so I feel like a lot of people are now going to get the opportunity to be entrepreneurs without realizing they are because they're freelancers. And then they're like, oh, wait. If I could perform this as a freelancer, get paid 5K a month, and then I had the same thing with another 5K, then I got 10K. And then if I did the same thing, I got 15K. And then they're going to find out to hire a VA in India or remotely in Colombia or you're there, and now they can scale their business at once. So, you know, I think people's, uh, uh, I think people's idea of being an entrepreneur is a little bit off. I think there's this weird concept of like being ashamed to lose and, and then being ashamed to succeed, right? And I think a lot of people don't even realize they're entrepreneurs now that they're freelancers. That's cool. And that's, that's, that's even more insight there. So I think for, for me, um, you know, becoming an entrepreneur was, was, was by design. Um, it was something that I always knew that I wanted to, to push towards. Right. And I, yeah. And I, but as you've mentioned, you see the signs, even from a young age where you're going out and you're hustling and you're enterprising through to coming up with ideas when you're in corporate companies that either aren't accepted or aren't allowed to be pushed through and want to break out that mold and you go and do something for yourself. What would you say? You mentioned before about failing fast and failing forward. What would you say are the greatest, maybe three learnings that you've had from failures that have catapulted you and Cloud's past where you're at today? Well, before I answer that, there's something you said where you said doing something for yourself. I would change that to say, if you want to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to be doing something for someone else and solving other people's problems to yeah. succeed. If you're doing it for selfish reasons, you automatically fail. Good point. Um, man, failing fast, failing hard. I would say knowing when... You could just make more cash with a job and it's better for your goals in the immediate time and knowing how to walk away and, and leave it or knowing how to sell it, right? Being like, okay, cool. My business is at half a million in revenue. I'm making 70,000. I get a job making hundred K. You could probably sell that business still, right? For a micro sell. And then um, I'm like, look, I've experienced, I know that what's like, I already know these things that what separates the, the leaders from the laggards is the people who try, fail always show up, right? So like, I remember something that happened to me when I had a water company and this water company, we would install these water coolers that are kind of common now. They're called point of use coolers. They're the coolers you see that don't have the five gallon bottle cooler. They have the water lines, right? Yeah. And they filter the water. So I'd go door to door, renting, renting them. You know, you buy them for 300 bucks, you rent them for 45 bucks a month, eight months, you're cash flow positive, you want an asset. It's, very, it's a good recurring stream of business. And I remember that I installed this water cooler in a high-end gym in a building in South Beach called the bath club and this is where like Beyonce and Jay-Z had like a 10 million dollar you know units like everything in South Beach is like that and I got a call I installed the machines myself right I was the install guy I was the, I was like 24 and I got a call from the guy and he's like your machine flooded overnight and destroyed our fucking our gym and I hung up and I, I, I said basically I'll be there in 10 minutes 
and I showed up and the guy was like, you actually came here and are accountable for what you, I was like cleaning the floor, you know, with my hands. And the guy went from being like, I'm going to fucking sue you to actually getting me to speak in front of the whole community of building managements. And I think that was the moment where I kind of confirmed what I already knew that like, you know, owning up to the mistakes is going to get you further in life. If that makes sense, you know, um, a lot of business owners, instead of like addressing a problem, they'll just skate around it and they'll point someone else at it. And then I'll just keep repeating these problems versus really kind of heading their, their problems head on and seeing them as opportunities to grow. You know, that was one. Right. Entrepreneurship is never any challenge. I mean, personally, I've, I've, I've experienced a lot. I'm like, I even, I even suffered from something called ulcerative colitis, which is, uh, kind of like Crohn's where it's an immune thing where my immune system will, will attack my large intestine. I've gotten sick during periods of stressfulness. I've had times where I, you know, had 50 employees, Christmas comes around, one of my customers fires us. I got to fire 20 employees for Christmas. I'm throwing up, you know, like it's going to take a toll on your health, but it can also, the thing about entrepreneurship is everybody's story is different, right? I think there's people who probably never touched the floor. There's people who, you know, you, you got people whose worst story is that like they made a bill, you know, We've, we've obviously heard a lot of famous people lately say that they've been fucked over by people that are worth billions, right? So a lot of victims in the world. I don't think your path to entrepreneurship can, does, always has to be bumpy. I just think that if you're not prepared for both scenarios, you're kind of tricking yourself. Like be prepared for the worst and be prepared for the best. Be nimble because don't get locked into anything, if that makes sense. You know, because I'm not saying that, you know, being an entrepreneur is going to make you sick, ruin your life, this and that. It's going to teach you a lot of stuff. It's just like these any preconceived conception, if you're not, if you're not men, if you're not mentally pliable and you're not constantly learning, probably not for you. Like I'm 40 years old in June. I am literally listening to podcasts on leadership every day and being like, oh my God, I'm an idiot. Right. Like I, I feel like, you know, I'm, I, you know, you, you mentioned when you introduced me, like you complimented me and in my mind, I'm not complimenting myself. Right. And I think if you have to have a mindset of just constantly getting better, because if you're not, someone else is going to be in your space with that mindset and it's best to work for, for him than against him. Yeah. Okay. So then on that point, um, when you're talking about, you know, doubling down on the, on these things and really focusing on learning, what, what are the, 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 you know, there's so much access for everybody. Now there's podcasts like we're on, there's books that we're on, there's all of the different seminars and that you can go to, there's a ton of stuff on YouTube. You can literally learn anything you want from YouTube. Right. Um, but what would you say is your go-to um, for learning and, and what would you kind of point people towards for being able to, you know, looking at how they scale their businesses in the right way and with the right types of content? Yeah, great question. I'm like, I, I personally, you know, self-diagnose myself with ADHD where I, I, I get distracted very easily and I have a short attention span and I love to be stimulated by multiple things. So I find YouTube to be the most interesting because I can be playing in the background. I could be listening to it. I stopped paying for Peloton um, service because I don't need somebody motivating me to do exercise. I just put YouTube on it. Right. Um, so I personally like YouTube. Uh, there's also, uh, a, a, something called get abstract that I subscribe to that summarizes books. So, you know, I tend to take business books, print out all the summaries, put them in one binder. So on an airplane, I can almost crush 20 books, but everyone's learning style is different. And, and, and I am not a, I'm not a, I'm not a book learner and I'm not a, I'm not like a, I don't know what the right word is, but I, I have my chief revenue officer, Tony, he's a guy who went to Kellogg. He's got his MBA. He is a book guy and he's always pushing on me to like be more, you know, I would say system driven. Everyone's got a different style. You know, the cool part is that there's something there for everybody. If you're, if you learn by taking courses and being at a class every day and taking a test, sign up to a course, right? If you learn with short attention span clip, follow, you know, some of your leaders on uh, YouTube and get your one to 30 minute clips. So cool part is like identify who you are, how, what your learning style is, and just find something that matches. I like it. Okay. So uh, more stuff that I love how these conversations just read more questions, right? Because you've got such an interesting background and the story that you've got as well. What would you say for how entrepreneurs can find the right business partner or the right types of people? To, to gel with and, and create a, an organization like the one you have. I think you just mentioned Tony is, is kind of for you, um, kind of yeah. that you work with, who's, who's well-read, he's got the book smarts, he's got the MBA, <clears throat> and he complements your personality and the way that you kind of go about things. How would you suggest to people that whether they do it for themselves or if they want to do it with somebody else, how they find 
the right kind of balance with, you know, working with people that are going to elevate them? It's an interesting question because I, I, I can't, if I would answer that question for how the way I do it, that's not scalable because I'm just a unique personality, right? So like I, I don't, I'm not common. My personality type is, is, is like two or 3% of the population. I am a very strong driver and, and a uh, assertive protagonist. Um, the, how I, I have a tendency of just being a person who generally wants to, I have like a general mode of life where like, I want to see everybody happy, healthy, and making money. Right. Like if I see a guy worth a billion dollars, I'm like, you're the man. How'd you do it? Like I never felt jealous. Right. So personally, I've been able to collect friends and never lose them because I'm always introducing them to business, money and friends. Right. It's like I'm always giving. And so Tony was a good friend of mine for five years. My chief technology officer who actually built Superfoods, which is another marketplace that raised five million, was successful. I was friends with him for a year and I didn't even know that he was a CTO for a public for a huge marketplace. So. My style is not scalable. Mine's more networking and giving. And if you network and give, you'll meet awesome people. Um, I would say if that's not your style, it's probably better to have a really, really thought out plan, right? And really have more of a business plan laid out, the, the core principles of what that person would be doing. Because if the person doesn't know you, you want to impress them by being like, look, I need you to be a COO. Here's what your job will be. Here's how you'll be measured. Here's how you'll be awarded. Year one, two, three, four. So it's like you're either going to have, you're either going to have the skill of getting people to follow you because they know that you're just a workaholic. You know, they like they're like, okay, I'm going to back a mirror, and he's not going to sleep, and he's going to put in more hours than me, and he's going to lead. Or they're going to be like, this guy's just very organized, know what he's doing. You could do both, right? But I would say that you know either of those are probably good advice. Um, I think that the leaders on my team would be doing a bit better job if I led up, right? And if I gave them more of a plan. Sometimes it just came by osmosis where like Tony started as an AE and then I bought my business partner out, saw him do some good stuff, knew he was a smart guy, made him a COO. Had I been more planned, I could have been there from the beginning and we could have got done faster. So yeah, I would just say, you know, using, using your, 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 your skills that, that get people to surround you and follow you because we're humans, we're all social animals, right? And then also planning and you could use ChatGDP4 now to say, build me a business plan. Make me a plan for a COO. You can literally use these tools to make you geniuses. You know, in the future, podcasts like this and millions of others will be scraped by these neural learning networks to give an answer that is just better than any one person can answer, right? Um, but I think it's a combination of your your core instincts and planning. Right, cool. So, so on that, then the rise of AI. Obviously, this is a, a huge topic that's buzzing around. You see it everywhere on LinkedIn, on YouTube, everywhere, right? Yeah. Well, from your perspective, where do you see, um, you know, kind of entrepreneurship, um, you know, business leadership in the next five to 10 years? Do you see the impact of AI permeating that as well? Or do you still feel that a lot of the old school kind of, you know, ethics of working hard, um, you know, networking, reading lots is ultimately the way that anybody's going to be able to build and scale a business to the degree that you achieve today? I'm going to give you a really fucked up answer. Um, I think AI is all around us and it's always been around us. To me, you're AI and, and Paul's AI. I can't prove that you're anything more than a program talking to me, right? So I think that we have this confusion that AI is this new thing, but in reality, humans were doing things. What separates humans from animals is that we document and write things down, right? And then we die and then we read it and we start off at like the cheat code. We start off at like Mario level nine, right? Animals don't do that, right? So that's why we're able to do what we do. We're always advancing. So AI to me has just been the same thing of organic humans. We're not organic because we don't know, right? Leaving information, we're following. So all that I see has changed is that the way of accessing all that information is now faster and more reliable, but it's not, it's really all human information, right? So it's like AI is just human information where you can access it faster, cheaper, and more efficient. So what are we going to do with that? information faster, more efficient. We're going to use it to our advantage because that's what we've always been doing. We've been learning from people, hiring people to have, not, let's not call it artificial, we'll call it their intelligence, improve our performance as humans. And now we're going to use AI as their intelligence to improve it faster with paying it less and being able to wake up at two in the morning and be like, make me a, an HTML code and it'll do it for you. So 
I think that it's going to allow people that understand that concept that we're always humans learning from humans to do it faster, cheaper, and more efficient. But I don't think anything really fundamentally changed besides the speed and efficiency of how we can get the information, which is fundamentally different, but it's still human information. Yeah. Okay. It might change, right? Like maybe now they start making their own information, right? But you could say that that's still all who came from humans. And I'd agree with you there um, because that's what ChatGPT does, right? It, it pulls all of the information that is learned from the internet before 2021 and it compiles mm. into something very fast and uh, uh, responsive in terms of the questions you ask it. So in, in relation to that, entrepreneur, you know, being an entrepreneur, it's, it's all kind of about um, execution as well, right? It's about you build and you build. Execution is everything. Right? So um, even though we have access to all this now fast information, does it really matter that much if people aren't able to execute against that? Yeah, that's your competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. Would you want everybody executing at a high level? Would you want to be competing against everyone being Bill Gates, Antoine? That would be tough, wouldn't it? It would be tough. I think it's your gift. I think, I think people don't understand that. Oh, man, this is messed up too. I, I, I call a lot of people NFPs, non-functional players, um, like 99% of the world. And I think they're, they're either there to distract you or they're for you to leverage, right? So, you know, I think that the people that don't do those things, that's, that's your opening, that's your gap, right? Like an F1 race car, probably it's like, point, it's like 0.2 seconds of a, a reaction that's the difference between a win and a loss. So, you know, I think that, um, I think that you, you always have to be competing with yourself, right? Like, like, like Michael Jordan says, pulled nine times and then realizing that, you know, the people's inability to execute is your ability to, to be ahead of them in this infinite game we're playing. Is, is there a right and a wrong way to go about that for you? Um, ultimately, you know, I, I would, I've definitely learned in the last few years of the importance of the speed of execution. Is there such a thing as too fast? Yes, there definitely is. Yeah. Uh, I'm like, things get crazier as companies get bigger. I, I, I have a very high risk tolerance on, you know, charting and now I'm becoming more defensive. You have to be very cognizant of, of macro environments, right? Like if, if you go really fast right now, perhaps there's another dip in the stock market, you get a credit call. You know, you have to be going fast is great if you understand how everything in your financial life is connected. Right. Right. And, you know, those who play defensive tend to play in the game longer, but hit less highs. And those play aggressive tend to hit higher highs, but get out of the game faster. Right. So I think it's just a balance of, of that really what's better for you. That's really cool. Um, all right. So I know that we're, we're kind of coming close to the end here. So I've got a couple of questions I want to fire at you. Yeah. Um, one of those being uh, really focused on what is the most unexpected lesson that you have had from being a business owner? Uh, my most unexpected lesson was really what is achievable. I think... I had to teach myself to set my goals to be a billion dollar organization because I think we're just not taught that every human is a human and everybody makes mistakes. And I think we're just, my biggest thing is like, man, I'm never talking to a super successful person who like hasn't lost his life savings, hasn't lost his wife, hasn't done some crazy. So I think my biggest lesson is that like success is really a, 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 for many and or most a formula of failure and, and more about how you respond to failure than how you respond to success, really. And they didn't teach, no one taught you that, right? They, they teach you to get the Ferrari, look at the Lambo, blah, 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 but they don't teach you that. It's how you get, you get smacked in the face. And, and if you get back up, you know, that's the winner, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's definitely learned the hard way. Um, so yeah, um, really, really interesting response there. Um, would you say um, for you that you've had, um, you know, an important professional mentor um, and do you believe that that's important for achieving ultimate success? Yeah. Well, I think social connections are important for humans, right? Um, I'm like, we've, I think I've been on like one of your shows, Antoine, Paul, like we have, there, there's a, a network state of, of leaders like ourselves introducing ourselves. We can message each other, you know, on, on WhatsApp. You guys in the UK, you message me uh, at six in the morning. Hey, we're going to the podcast. I'm a little late, right? Um, I just think that, 
you know, I think that I think that the, the human connection is always been there and people just need to kind of use that to their advantage because it's it's part of what makes us human. Yeah, well, absolutely. Uh, By the way, I have not had my coffee and it's like 630. So I'm rambling a little bit. So <laughs> it's been a good ramble, man. It's been a good day. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. I didn't sleep last night either. Yeah. Uh, well, that's, uh, that's the uh, life, right? Got the first ever sales agency event May 12th in Colombia and I'm bringing a up bringing a bunch of people from uh, across the world to Medellin. And this is the one time where I'm actually telling my team to collect the, collect the emergency contact information in case people party too much. So now I'm like worried, like a parent, you know, <laughs> worried about, I'm worried about people having too much fun here when they're here. Why me out? Where's my ticket? <laughs> next year, man, next year. I gotta make some money. Well, okay. uh, well look, um, I mean, one other question that I have for you, uh, it might seem a little bit left field, but you're a man strongly opinionated. You've done a lot in business, um, obviously take cloud tasks from mucking to the you know, kind of global company it is today. So tell me one thing about your either field of expertise or what you've learned that almost no one agrees with you about today. Man, that's a good, point. my field of expertise that no one agrees with me. Okay, great. I'll give it to you. Uh, I think SDR should be measured on the traffic they drive to a website as the number one metric because we are saying things that we're not agreeing with. We're telling people that the buyer is now digital. Your website's everything. 85% of buyers know what they want. And then we're trying to get people to do SQLs on cold calls versus website traffic. So a lot of people won't agree with me. And a, a lot of our agencies in our marketplace you know, and my, myself, I have an agency with 265 SDRs making meetings. I thought it was the stupidest fucking KPI. And we were making a lot of money for our customers. We made a lot of money for ourselves. And if our clients understood that demand gen is really driving website visits, those website visits will decide whether or not they want to become an SQL by now responding email or call and saying, yes, I'll meet or filling out a form or becoming an MQL, right? That's the path that we have all are agreeing on, but we're not executing that path because we're all too afraid to be the first one to do it, I'm doing it. I'm going to do it out loud and I'm going to share the success for the next two years. But that is the one thing that everybody in the industry would not agree with me on. And they won't agree with me because they're just too scared to say the truth. And by the way, my pronoun, pronouns are him, he. <laughs> and if I offend you for that, I'm sorry too. Well, thanks for clarifying that, Amir. Um, when I was an awesome answer, I was an awesome answer. So, well, I mean, where, where, where can listeners find you online? How can they at you? Where, where's the best place to find? Yeah. I'm like LinkedIn, Amir Writer, uh, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Amir Writer. I keep it freaking, I keep it simple. Um, and YouTube, uh, CloudTest CEO is the handle, Amir Writer. And I'm going to be producing lots of content with amazing, highly intelligent, capable gentlemen like you guys. Um, thank you for having me on the show, guys. And uh, if anybody has any questions about business, life, travel, those kind of topics, I like talking about it. Been awesome having you, man. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, guys. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks for joining us, Amir. It's been a, it's been a really interesting show, and Anton, some great questions. Um, it's been nice for me as, as as the as the regular leader of podcasts to uh, to kind of take a step back and just enjoy the actual show. Some, some fantastic answers, Amir. On uh, on no doubt, I'll pick you. You got people that are honest. I don't find honest people anymore. Do you find do you talk to like really direct honest people or not so much? Everyone's afraid of getting cancelled right now, as I am. Yeah, I think I think uh, yeah. most most people think they're honest. I'm not, I'm not quite sure if people are honest with themselves. That's the problem, right? You get a lot. You go far. You go far with honesty. Dude, I'm always giving people advice. I'm like, I'm easier. Like every time I give them advice, I'm like, I just say something. They're like, How did you come up with that? I was like, Because it's the honest truth. And they're like, oh, no. <laughs> they like really struggle with that shit. It's crazy. Yeah. Radical. Yeah. Yeah.